thanks everyone for joining um and welcome to alpha venture dao's amy session so in today's space uh we'll talk about the evolution of DeFi's and what's next with uh camel ceo and co-founder of contango and mitch uh de- business developer at contango and today we also have a very special guest uh, that is nipun our head of tech at alpha venture dao so hi so can you guys take turns to introduce yourself Sure, I go first then. <laughs> yeah, my name is Kyle. I'm a co-founder and CEO at Contango. Contango is a DeFi derivatives uh, exchange focused on explorable futures. Oh, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Mitch. Thanks so much for having us. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm the business developer at Contango. Um, been working in the economics field over the past few years and joined the crypto movement, I think a couple of years ago. Happy to be here. Hey, Kamu, hey, Mitch. Uh, hey, everyone. So uh, uh, I'm Nipun. I'm a co-founder and head of tech uh, at Alpha, uh, mostly overseeing the smart contract development and also the risk and uh, research side of things. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction, guys. Okay, so before we start, I'll just go through the agenda very quickly. So in the session, uh, we'll spend around 40 minutes discussing the DeFi and the derivatives landscape, and then around 10 to 15 minutes answering questions from the audience. So anyone who has questions, uh, please request to become a speaker during the Q&A session, and then I'll unmute you for you to ask your questions. Okay. All right, let's get started. So uh, first, I uh, want to talk about the DeFi landscape as a whole so ever since uh, DeFi summer like you know a lot more people are, saw the need of the non-custodial the censorship resistance and so let's start with Nippon so what's the current sentiment of DeFi now yeah actually that's a good question and, and yeah the sentiment has been shifting like uh, quite a lot right the narrative and stuff uh, from uh DeFi, the NFTs, and the game five for a bit. Um, yeah, so so what's actually going on with the DeFi uh, landscape, right? Um, so I this this needs to go back, um, like in DeFi summer, right? Um, back in uh, 2000, 2020. So twenty twenty, um, DeFi summer was like um triple digits, uh, quad digits APYs. It was great, crazy, um, and people uh, aped in, right? Um, chasing the yields, and so it began the yield farming craze. Um, compared to now, if you think about it, um, there's um, perhaps like a low single or low double digit uh, yield farm uh, uh, possibilities right now. Um, so what's the difference here? Uh, and then, right? Um, so I think th- there are a couple of things that 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 are different. Um, first is uh, back then, uh, liquidity mining or yield farming was a new thing. So so people people were excited about the new concept innovations back then, right? Uh, it was not possible before. But then they, uh, like Compound, I think, is the first one who introduced a liquidity mining concept um, and perhaps it's synthetics. Um, yeah, and so, so, so people were um, into it uh, and, and then people, more people join in uh, and then the yields um, increase. Uh, people, more, as more people join in, um, token prices also rises and that increases the yield APYs and stuff. So it's a compound effect, um, but eventually, like that is the last, right? Uh, eventually, um, the use were not sustainable, um, and so 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 things are uh, winded down uh, to to at some point, right? And more users uh, get to know more that actually um, the yields are um, may maybe look may may look high in APY wise, but then there are some potential uh, losses are elsewhere, right? For example, if you provide uh, LPs, you can get wrecked um, from ILs and stuff. So uh, as time goes on, um, people get to know more. Okay, uh, actually, this is not um, a good opportunity. Uh, they know about more about risk and, and rewards. And so over time, uh, things have, has played out. And then eventually, market becomes more uh, efficient as well. So so as time goes, uh, people are more educated, learn more about risk and stuff. And, and so the use would uh, come, comes back down. And then uh, afterwards, um, I think I would say... Uh, series of events that had also happened um like a big protocol like collapse and 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 also like a, a big like organizations have uh ha- have gone through like a 
a series of events uh, that we have seen in the past uh, few months of us uh, in, in the past year. And we can see that anything we believed in uh, could easily break. Uh, what I mean is like assumptions that we make uh, in terms of like token prices never reached this point, it will never go down to this point. Uh, these assumptions uh, break, right? Um, and so if you compare it uh, now to the DeFi back then, right? Um, then uh, the current sentiment, I think uh, what people uh, want right now in DeFi is not high, like crazy high yields, um, but rather um, a safe place uh, where you can uh, easily put your money in there and then, uh, and then let everything uh, be automated. Uh, basically, the yields come may not be as high as like double digits, uh, triple digits, quad digits, um, but would be more, put more emphasis on, on the safer uh, mechanics, things that looks more sustainable, uh, more realistic. Um, and that's what I think um, the current market uh, is looking for. And that's what's going to be um, what the people actually want to build as well uh, in terms of to, to answer the market's demands. Right. So, so for each of you, what are the kind of opportunities you guys see in the DeFi market right now? Like, what do you think comes next after all these uh, yield farming and lending and borrowing that's in the market? Uh, Nippon, you can go first. Uh, can you repeat the question? Sorry. So what, are, what do you think are the opportunities that you guys see in the DeFi market right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, um, opportunities, um, there's, there are quite a lot, but then, um, like, why? Because um, right now, and compared to the past, right, uh, the opportunities are, are quite different. Um, back then, um, opportunities were uh, mostly, like, um, there, there are no building blocks yet, so people are building, like, major building blocks, for example, lending protocol, uh, DEXs, uh, maybe forks, uh, and things are going on, right? Um, right now, what people have, have been focusing on uh, for quite some time is... Um, how to optimize yields, right? You can see lots of protocols trying to uh, launch like port strategies, uh, building on top of others. So we can see lots of uh, protocols actually focusing on uh, how do you make sure that people can gain yield in the easiest way possible. So improving the UX for the users, how to onboard users uh, more and more. Um, and that's uh, where I see uh, it is going to the right direction that in order for a protocol to onboard users, right, uh, which... Uh, may or may not have uh, been well educated in terms of uh, uh, how they get used to uh, the DeFi space in terms of onboard from Web two to Web three. Uh, what they need is a simple, uh, understandable uh, usages uh, and with a uh, risk uh, well well laid out. So, what I think um, the next thing about yield farming and lending, and this goes back to what I think uh, the uh, what people are looking for again is. Uh, kind of a safe place uh, where uh, people, uh, users, um, or institutions uh, can play a part in and trust that um, things can work perfectly without, uh, without much risk, right? So in terms of yields, it should be sustainable and uh, there's, there should be more transparency in where the yields come from. Because if, if there's a yield, uh, then, then someone needs to, to, to be, I would say, like, Pay favorite view, right? Because if you think about the macro level, everything is zero sum. But in that zero sum, uh, some parts of the yields, uh, people may want to get, like, uh, what I mean is, um, some like the, the negative part can come from the actual actual demand that people are willing to pay. For example, in Uniswap, uh, people are willing to pay for swap uh, as swap fees, right? and that goes in as a negative, uh, net negative for for the traders. Uh, but in a sense, uh the utility function of that person is positive because they get to trade the tokens, uh, for example. And that negative, uh, in that zero sum, uh, the positive, the negative sides, uh, it gets a transfer to the other party uh, in, in, in terms of like the counterparty gets a positive uh, net uh, profit in that sense. So uh, in what I see is the next thing in the DeFi, if, if, there were, if there were to be any innovations in this space, it would be how would they... Um, capture the value that actually meets the real demand or um, real usage uh, in that sense, and then capture that value and then capture the value and then transfer them to the uh, party that actually um, 
invest in the tokens or or or, or, or the um, token holders, for example. Yeah, that totally makes sense. What do you think, Mitch? Do you want to- yeah, I, I I agree a hundred percent with Nipu, and I think the the buzzword today is real yield. If you go on crypto Twitter, definitely everyone is talking about real yields, and I think that's, I don't know if that's going to be the next thing. I think that's the thing of today. And I think it's a pretty good one because it really tells you a story of, yeah, the market maturing a little bit, not chasing those high APIs, as Nippon was saying, especially after the, the Terra crash. And I think people are willing to do, you know, the extra mile, maybe, you know, read a little bit more the docs of the protocols they're investing in uh, or playing with. And it's not a coincidence that there was, I think, a boom in the in a lot of options protocols, a lot of structured products, a lot of option vaults being built uh, with this idea in mind, of building of bringing real yields to to retail. And that's also good because uh, we were having a chat with Adam and Finance, um, I think, some some days ago, and uh, we were actually discussing this: uh, the, the coming of the institutions. Of course, structured products are. Uh, probably one of the next big things uh, as well. Um, Nipun was saying we're, we're building the, the key building blocks of DeFi and probably one of the next uh, building block is a structured product. Uh, that's one thing that TreadFi can relate a lot to, I think. Um, so that's definitely, I think, uh, my, my key takeaway in this is, yeah, a more mature market, not chasing the API, real yields and probably yeah, structured products. Camel, were you gonna say something? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, I find this discussion super interesting about real yields um, because I think there is the um, the thing about DeFi where you you always get a, a variable rate, and it's possible that you 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 come into a a, a protocol or you come to a vault which is super high APY, but this is a variable APY. Um, what happens is like you get this super high APY because you're, you're one of the first and then suddenly this rate goes to zero. And I think I have a, maybe another interesting view. I think I'm super excited of about like building the, um, the next like, um, Peters uh, of DeFi, and I'm thinking about fixed rates, right? Because like when when you get into a fixed rate, uh, it's a real yield. It's it's something that you're you're ensured to to have at the end of um, a time window, and it's even more interesting to see new protocols. Uh, doing stuff such as interest rate swap. We can think about vaults or IPOR. And these protocols, for example, they allow you to to swap a variable rate against a fixed rate. So even if you're like on something like uh, whatever protocol that gives you a variable rate, you can still ensure a real yield by swapping back to a fixed rate. So um, I'm super excited to, to see the evolution in this space and see how we're going to, to stabilize DeFi um, around this topic. All right. Okay, cool. Okay, so over to Camel and Mitch for this one. So, um, yeah. So how do you look at DeFi from your lenses and apply it to what you want to do? Um, I'll start. Um, if I understand the question correctly, um, for, for example, at least in, in my opinion, when I got into DeFi, I, I got into it for the um, openness of it. Uh, I used to work a lot in, in global NGOs, um, also private companies with a lot of social responsibility tied to their mandate. And 
I decided to turn to, to the dark side, as I like to call it, uh, that is DeFi, uh, when I also saw that potential in it, the, the, the openness of the space. And actually, my friends, when they, when they asked me about you know, DeFi, what is it, if I can explain it like in a, in a few words, I always tell them, just, just go to either scan, because that's the blockchain. You know, that's what's going to happen. That's how it works. There are transactions. Just click on it, understand how it works. And uh, DeFi is going to be built on this. Um, so how do I apply this view to what we do? For example, at Contango, is we try to build something, of course, open source, and also something simple. Uh, I think we all got into DeFi. I think I can speak for Kamel here as well, uh, because of the simplicity it can bring about in our world. Um, of course, we're all talking about, you know, uh, substituting the entire thread phi, we, I think we we know it's not going to happen in the blink of an eye. Uh, it's going to take a few, you know, months or years, and it's not going to be immediate. It's going to be a transition. Uh, but we still like this idea of becoming the ultimate, you know, uh, space where people could, you know, uh, use finance for their daily lives. So definitely openness and and transparency and building something simple. I think is, uh, is my key takeaway here. Right, I completely agree. So how about Nippon? Like in terms of project, what are you looking for? Yeah, um, in terms of projects, um, so like I said before, um, like um, we we need to think into uh, the projects um, right now. Uh, like even back then, uh, I look at I normally look at fundamentals. So how things work. Uh, in terms of technical, in terms of product, and in terms of like, is it sustainable? Uh, if if the product project is is really um, something that I would personally um, like try it uh, in terms of product project that I would like try to invest in terms of if, if that's my line, line of thought, uh, and this also applies to um, let's say for Alpha Venture now, right? Um, so. When we think about projects, uh, we also need to think about the fundamentals. We need to also think about uh, how understanding deeply how it works, where the yields come from, uh, token makes it, do they make sense? And then those all tie together back um, and then comes down to, okay, um, are these projects uh, uh, the thing that we want to, um, the, the, it, would, would these kind of projects be the next big thing, right? And that's... Um, where we think about uh, projects that we want to incubate. And, then, and so these criteria becomes the core of uh, how we determine uh, which projects uh, we select um, and we pick from the incubated projects. And we can see that lots of, uh, like from our applications, we get um, like lots of uh, projects that are uh, perhaps um, uh, proposed like interesting ideas, but there's no way um, these projects would work. Um, because uh, the token makes does it make sense? Uh, the yields were um only they are only printing money. Uh, and they the incentives don't align for each of the parties. For example, um, e eventually they comes down to okay, they're just printing money to 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 give to 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 people, and then some percentage of that uh goes back to the uh, the team. For example, so it's gonna be like a uh, cash grab. For example, and those are not like the projects that we want to 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 incubate uh want to have relationship with uh, we want to think about projects and incubate uh long-term projects that uh want to bring value to the ecosystem as a whole and and yeah and that's basically how we think about uh the projects yeah that's a really great perspective it's definitely uh useful to everyone and builders and so what do you think is are the success metrics for the DeFi space and that will drive its mass adoption. Uh, we can start with Nippon for this one. Yeah, actually, um, the answer is uh, for me. Uh, the answer is uh, quite tricky. Uh, so, so the quest first question is uh, the success metric, right? Um, so it depends on there. There are multiple ways you can think about it, right? Uh, in terms of project. Um, like if you think about it, not necessarily DeFi, but anything, any project, um, usually the, the, the first and, and the most, I would say, uh, trivial um, metric is TVL, for example, total value locked, right? So how much 
money actually locked in there um, in US dollars, for example. The higher it represents, um, oh, actually you have like more, you have real usages, um, you get legitimacy from, you get the perception of it being successful at that point. So that's one thing we can think about metrics. Uh, but what, what I often try to think um, more than just TVL is um, in terms of, again, like fundamentals, how, how, how protocols work, right? Um, do, do the yields make sense? Um, do tokenomics make sense? And those tie in together. Um, and, and those become like uh, metrics that I often think of. So, so, so I often, again, evaluate these things um, in terms of uh, multiple axes, right? Um, in terms of uh, sustainability, uh, scalability, and, and the team themselves. Um, but for DeFi as a whole, uh, as, as a space, I think um, for it to be, for it to get a success uh, in terms of DeFi, not, not as, as a project level, is when uh, more and more people, um, well, basically the success metric uh, is actually to get like the mass adoption from from the users, right? And mass adoption comes comes from um, when I mean mass adoption, I mean not just people aping in uh, like previously, but from the fact that it becomes like um, like DeFi actually becomes like the the, the go to thing, uh, like how people use um, in normal life. For example, people use internet uh, right now uh, as normal. Um, so what I think uh, would be the key success metric, and this would be I'm not sure when when would this be. Uh, uh, maybe in the next cycle or the next next cycle, um, where DeFi is now it is then treated as like um, regular thing. I, I would say um, not just like it's, the concept is too hard. Uh, so that means uh, in order for 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 the real mass adoption uh, for DeFi to happen, um, there needs to be tools, uh, either uh, development tools that help builders uh, build. Uh, products, uh, projects uh, that is easy so that uh, there are no issues. For example, there's no uh, easy exploitable um, uh, vulnerabilities that, that can happen. For example, we can see that lots of, lots of projects and DeFi projects um, often suffer from flash loan attacks, for example, and it has been repeatedly um, happening. And this could, I mean, if we, we, if we have like best practices, then this could have been prevented at either um, a tooling level or, or or like standard library level, um, there are multiple ways we can prevent this, or maybe the tooling, uh, like security check tools that help uh, we detect this in the future. Um, so in terms of tooling, um, in terms of uh, education, in terms of like um, understanding the risk, how people can evaluate which project uh, and think about uh, the risk in terms of uh, how protocols work. So this is, this is like um, not well understood because uh, protocols in DeFi are often complex and some of them may require technical knowledge as well. Um, yeah, um, so, so in order for them to, in order for the space, the DeFi space as a whole to, to get um, widely adopted, I think uh, like there are multiple things uh, that, that are still missing uh, from, from the, the current stage. And, and as time goes, uh, we can see, um, we should see um, more and more um, Things getting built, uh, tooling getting built, uh, and, and like knowledge getting uh, more and more wide, widespread and talk, talked about, and it becomes like the common concept that people understand, uh, like how to use the internet. Um, so that's where uh, I'm thinking uh, the eventual goal uh, for the DeFi to be like a successful um, space. Right. Okay. Uh, Kama, Mitch, anything you want to add on to that? Yeah, if, if I can add something to, to that, I'll probably say, yes, I think a, a success metric for me, I always like to say a success, success metric for, for DeFi in general would be my grandma using it. Because I think we should remind ourselves we're uh, always surrounded by non-crypto people. And so... A key indicator would be, you know, your friends, your family, your grandma using it in, in, in their daily, daily lives, um, receiving, you know, payments, uh, uh, doing any kind of operation uh, that we normally do through other apps or banking systems. And 
So definitely, like Nipun said, uh, some improvements on the UI, UX are mostly needed. But if you look, for example, the Arjun bullet or um, any kind of top-notch uh, uh, wallet product, I think we're in the right direction there. And also, yeah, a contango, a little bit of shilling here. Uh, we're, we're mobile first. Uh, that's why we try to design everything since inception, since we started the, the protocol uh, with the mobile in, in mind, because it's part of our daily lives already. And probably another aspect I think that will help mass adoption Probably is not a popular take, but uh, legal certainty or a little bit of regulation. I know we think of regulation as something bad because we're, you know, we believe in the DeFi ethos. But if you think about your friends, your known crypto friends, they would probably look at you like some crazy person doing crazy legal stuff in crypto, right? Uh, like a risk prone person. And if we want risk-averse people to be on board in DeFi, I think there should be some indications as well um, with, some, with some legal framework. I'm not saying DeFi should be regulated, of course. Um, but yeah, uh, if we want on board uh, a lot of people, millions of people, billions of people, uh, if, we want it, if we want it to become part of the daily lives, uh, I think that's a key aspect to, to keep in mind as well, the legal framework. Yeah, I completely agree because um, that kind of, kind of restricts the builders to, from taking risks as well. So, what do you guys think will drive the DeFi to the next bullish cycle again? Uh, we can start with uh, Nippon. Yeah. Um, so, the next bullish cycle, um, that's, I think it's pretty hard to answer. Um, and then tricky um, because I mean if I know I, I would already be building the, the product for example a narrative already um, but yeah in general like the, the next cycle um, I mean it depends uh, but yeah as I said earlier um, the what people are looking for right now um, is is something that um, no longer like a high yield chase um, but something that is more fundamental, um, so 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 we we can think of there are multiple things that, that multiple angles that, that we can think about. Um, for example, um, maybe uh, if if we think of in terms of innovations, um, we can think of uh, more like how do we ensure that like on I would say like institutions, for example, uh, maybe. So there, there, there needs to be some like trigger points that 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 would initiate like a new wave of people uh, to join in. Uh, for example, um, legal uh, could be one thing. Uh, if uh, if we have a clear um, legal implications um, and and what should be considered what, because um, right now it's it's quite in the, in the gray area where um, where some things are legal and something are not. Uh, if you get a clear um, say of what can be done uh, that should help as well uh, and in terms of uh, products in terms of projects I think innovations right now in DeFi are mostly I would say the building blocks are already there um, I don't think there's anything missing in terms of building blocks for example if you compare to the traditional finance um, DEX is compared to um, like trading I would say not trading would match to forex, for example, um, lendings and borrowings um, already exist. Uh, so as compared to bank, um, what's missing? Uh, and this is also related to uh, Contango, right? Um, so structured products. Um, so right now, not a lot of people have been focusing on structured products, or or, or maybe they 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 are. I mean, there there are some, but. Institutions, uh, for example, are more risk averse. Um, they don't want to take risk in terms of DeFi because there may be complexities in terms of, uh, I mean, legal, like I said, um, and also in terms of understanding of how protocols work. Um, so once um, things get more clear um, and and the 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 community, um, the the 
ecosystem uh, more well understood. Um, when adoption can get more into this space, um, in terms of like uh, this, these products, then I think um, that can kickstart a new wave from institutions and from uh, a more educated groups of people that uh, are willing to 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 play part in this um, DeFi cycle, this new DeFi cycle. Right. So uh, what are the new innovations that you've seen recently in the DeFi space? Uh, perhaps you could give us some examples of a few. Yeah, I can I can take this one. Uh, I have a few things in mind since Kamel said uh, we're kind of experts of, of the fixed rate markets right now because we're doing a lot of uh, research on this uh, because we'd, we'd like to integrate with as many protocols as possible because of the way our protocol works. We, we price futures through spot and fixed rate markets. And one project we were quite, a, quite happy to see uh, was uh, IPER. Uh, I think we have Darren here connected uh, uh, in the group. Uh, we got to know the IPER project in Paris at ETCC. It was me and Kamel actually going to, to this conference about you know, switching from the LIBOR index to this IPER index. And we were kind of blown away by, by this concept. Um, it's a kind of super nice product they're building out there. It's a new inter-protocol index, uh, kind of a risk-free risk -free, uh, rate on different, on different currencies across different protocols. So pretty nice idea there because they've also been de building derivatives out of that and it's good for us for, for integration. And still on the fixed rate markets, um, we had a few chats with the guys as Weevil and also Fiat DAO, uh, a good couple of protocols that are building super cool stuff, in, in my opinion, on the fixed rate space. All right. Um, so now that uh, we've mentioned uh, Contango and basically it brings uh, its viable futures to DeFi. So perhaps like uh, Camel or Mitch, could you basically uh, explain what it is and how the future market was earlier in comparison to now? Sure. I take this one. So maybe it's interesting to, to step back. Uh, a little bit and understand the landscape first. So if you look at uh, CFI, what we have there is um, like looking at the 2021 uh, report from Token Insight, there was like 112 trillions of dollars exchanged um, in CFI. And out of this, 50% was on perpetual futures. And then on expirable futures, you have a 6%, which represents uh, around uh, 7 trillion. Okay, so in C5, we have this structure where there is a market way bigger for perp, but with expirable being like a considerable size. And also like to, to be very clear on the order of, of magnitude, uh, option market were 0.4%. So experimental futures is a market 15 times bigger than options. And DeFi has mainly focused on building option markets and perps. So now we arrived in the DeFi space. We were super amazed by what was available there. And we were trading like cash and carry uh, strategies in, in, in DeFi. Uh, basically, for example, if the, the futures is above the spot, what we, you would do is to short the spot, lo, go long, sorry, short the futures, go long the spot, wait for expiry, and be sure to, to lock a risk-free profit. We wanted to bring this kind of vault in DeFi, and we couldn't find any expirable futures exchange. And this is how we came up with the idea of Contango. We're looking at the theoretical formula from financial engineering called the interest rate parity, which says that you can synthesize a futures position by using fixed rate markets. 
So, for example, if you want to go long ETH buy on the December uh, 22 maturity, what you would do is to borrow DAI at a fixed rate on the same maturity, swap DAI for ETH, for example, on Uniswap, and then land ETH at a fixed rate on the same maturity. And if you replicate these steps, then you have an expirable futures position. The timing here is super interesting because to, to see a product like Contango, you need fixed rate markets. And fixed rate markets are very young. They are like almost like one, two years old at maximum. So there is a, a super interesting timing in this story. And the thesis of Contango is to say, well, DeFi compatibility is amazing. We can create stuff that have never existed before. So even in TradFi or CFi, if you try to do that, it will be way more complicated because you don't have the atomicity of the transactions. So on Contango, we borrow swap land in one transaction to ensure the, the pricing. And the other thing that is interesting is that fixed rate markets in TradFi, they are the biggest market in the world. So what we're saying is that we're going to tap into the liquidity of the biggest markets in the world, and we're going to price expirable futures this way, which is very different from TradFi and TFi, where you need market makers on each exchanges on each market. So this is what we're doing in a nutshell, Contango. Thanks, Camel. Um, so basically for new uh, listeners, who just joined, Contango is one of our incubated projects and they're the first DEX that uh, brings expirable futures to DeFi without any uh, order books or liquidity pools. So basically uh, traders no longer have to bear the burden of the funding rates as everything is all paid up front and also you have full control of your cost. So yeah, since uh, Contango is a DEX and you've basically been living and breathing in the DEX industry, what are the challenges of, with operating DEX? Is there anything specifically related to the derivatives market? Okay, I can take this one. Um, so it, it's interesting because we are a DEX because you can see us as a decentralized exchange but as you mentioned correctly we don't have our own liquidity pool uh, we're using the liquidity pool of the fixed rate markets and we hope this is an interesting trend that we're creating because one of the main challenges for a DEX is to attract liquidity in their own liquidity pool and to bootstrap the liquidity, what you would do is to have incentives, like uh, usually like tokens from the projects to attract people to bring their token. Um, you will reward them. And this is where you get the first yield we were talking about at the start of the talk. So the more liquidity you attract, the more people there is and the less rewards there are, there are four people. Um, this is how yield goes goes to zero. And this is very challenging, especially because you, you have a lot of, of DEXs at the moment. Um, the space starts to be overcrowded. You have a lot of DEXs for spots, obviously, but you have now a lot of DEXs for perps and a lot of DEXs for options. So um, it's very interesting to be on, on a segment where you... You, 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 you're a market leader, you're first, and not having the, the challenges uh, we have around bringing liquidity. And um, however, like this kind of design brings other challenges because you need to integrate other protocols with their own specificity, their own oracles, and it's, it's a complete new design. So yeah, we're super happy to bring a new kind of DEX here. All right. Uh, so one last question before we switch to Q&A session. So just talking about the current market condition, how has the bear market uh, like affected uh, the DEX ecosystem and the futures market for you guys? If I can take this one, then feel free to pitch in, Kamal, if you want. Um, I think a key thing to remember is that 
over the past few weeks and months, a lot of these perfect exchanges that, that Kamal was mentioning uh, have gone in, in, in backwardation. The funding fees are negative. So we were talking a lot about structured products uh, before. There are a lot of cash and carry vaults uh, being built as well on, on these perpetual protocols. And of course, these products are not profit profitable anymore. And the thing that was that Kamal was explaining before about the um, certainty of trading inspirable futures is exactly this, is that you as a trader uh, are not subjected, subjected to the unpredictability of funding fees uh, with expirable futures. And you can easily make, for example, a, a cash and carry trade um, vanilla style, just like Arthur Hayes explained in, in his article, all on board. We always like to, to shield this article to everyone. And he always says, uh, the cash and carry trade with expirable futures is that kind of trade that where your wallet at the end really matches your spreadsheet. And that's something I think traders really like. So definitely the bear market, I think, uh, is putting a burden a burden on on, on perp dexes in, in this sense. And probably another takeaway is that if you remember, the bear market started with a, with a Luna crash, and a few other things. And there were a lot of dexes being built on that ecosystem, and they were completely... Uh, destroyed and blown away, probably because their first trading pair was Luna USDT or some related Luna coin, um, and that's some people might call it natural selection, but that's also not so good for you know the DeFi ecosystem because there are a lot of teams, a lot of money being being put on this ideas, and probably a lot of brilliance as the ideas have been swept away, and a lot of team uh, a lot of teams had to pivot. Um, but yeah, you know, the things, uh, the nice thing about crypto is that it goes in cycles. So I think we're all here to for the next bull run. Great. Um, thank you all for your great insights and takeaways for today. Um, so now I'll open the floor for our listeners to ask questions for Nippon or the Contango team. So feel free to ask permission to become speaker if you have any questions, or you can also write your questions and use hashtag AskAlpha and I will read out your questions. So, okay, we have, we have Darren. Hi, Darren. Hi, Darren. You can ask your questions now. Oh, hey, guys. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm actually not here for any questions. I wanted to thank you for the multiple shout outs for, for IPOR and actually very excited, uh, you know, because essentially uh, Contango brings, uh, Contango builds upon, you know, these different kind of DeFi primitives, you know, such as the IPOR index and, uh, and the swaps and the interest rate futures. It adds you know, it adds volume to DEX and it adds utility for, for passive investors. So we're really excited to be, uh, you know, building something that we can work together on. Yeah, same. Happy to see you here. Thanks, Darren. Yeah, thanks, Darren, for joining. Um, Nisa, you have any questions for the team? Yes. Yeah, so um, just regarding your question around like what is going to be, you know, the future for DeFi, especially under the current regulatory development, um, rather than the question, I, I wanted to share my worldview and socialize that and see, uh, you know, hear your feedback and, and, you know, understand like how you view it, because uh, I think it will be valuable to, to gather your opinion. Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, under the current regulatory pressure, and obviously the regulators are not particularly care, clear about what to do with the sector themselves. Um, they're struggling between, you know, stifling innovation and protecting the consumer and obviously self-advance interests, just like any human human activities. Um, you know, the, the thing is, uh, there simply are a lot of things they just can't regulate, right? There's It's so easy for DeFi projects to, to do um, sort of, regulatory arbitrage you know there are different countries like if you look at all the countries if you just follow strictly by the rules uh, more than a half of the world population can't really do DeFi because 
you know, China is banning it. And in the U.S., you can't do it. It's because everything is security token. Obviously, Russia is sanctioned. And then, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of other countries um, are, are sanctioned or, you know, banning crypto. Um, but then in reality, people from all of those above countries are actually using DeFi. So I think, in, you know, in terms of regulatory development, there will be, um, you know, obviously crypto projects like um, like Circle, for example, they will actively follow the regulatory guidance and they have to comply because they have, you know, all this on, on and off ramp thing that they, they can't just, they just can't get away with. Or maybe they have huge source of funds from U.S. In, institutional investors, etc., um, and those guys will be, you know, they will join the um, the, the lobby and the, uh, you know, the voice of pushing for regulatory changes to make it a little bit more up to date uh, in the Web3 world. Where in the meanwhile, there are also other types of DeFi projects that just go completely decentralized and go stealth. And, you know, none of the members can be found in public or they live in some, you know, uh, or, 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 you know, secret countries. Um, and then they will you know, move away from any sort of centralized stable coins. They will just use state decentralized collateral for, you know, for their protocols. I think DAI is going that direction. Uh, so it's like, you know, two types of DeFi going two extreme ways, trying to, to find their way of living. Um, but eventually, you know, at some point, they would, they will join somewhere, like they will meet somewhere in the middle because there will be values circulating between the complete decentralized world and the, you know, uh, from uh, stable coins to, you know, to regulatory entity, regulate, regulated entities, uh, centralized exchanges. There, there's simply no way to, to have complete removal of that interoperability. I think that is when, you know, it's kind of like playing a go game, right? Like you're connecting those uh, those those dots and the regulators will have no choice but to work with it work with the trend um, if they can't curb it they can't catch it they might as well work with it and that is when I see you know in the next few years the regulators will find they will realize that U U.S. is already saying you know let's let, if it happens let it happen in the U.S. because it is going to impact the competitive competitiveness of the national economy and funny enough yesterday I saw an article from uh, a, a uh, a public account, a social account called uh, Liao Liao Wang Zhiku. It's actually a, a think tank. It's a Chinese official think tank talking about, you know, what is all about Web three and why is the US racing to get in the country. So I think, look, if, if the com the the governments are smart and they, they will look into it, uh, Singapore is already doing heaps of that. Um, I think that that's that's where the industry is going. But I'm just wondering, you know, what type of DeFi projects will we see moving towards that complete? decentralization route um, as, a, you know, as the pioneers, basically, and, and that, you know, they can completely go off hook from the, the regulators, um, at least in the near future, to, to, to you know, to, to occupy that space. Sorry, I, my question might be too long, um, but I just wanted to, you know, to hear if you, if it, uh, if you echo is my opinion or if you've seen anything or you know have have any um any feedback yeah um actually i i think uh your, your point is really great um i agree um that right now i think i think um the regulators um are kind of i would say um they're they don't know much uh, about web3 that much right uh, and 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 what happens is um they're two extremes right now so regulators are trying to um, to limit like the access and maybe uh, like for example like Toronto Cash for example right uh, the US um, deems that um, the, the, the sanction the ban is going on um, and there's a valid reason why they they, they 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 why they want to to ban it but at the same time um, they are also uh, like banning like innocent users as well so so I mean uh, eventually um there needs to be a common ground uh, for 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 um, for regulators uh, to understand more about the space uh, and how uh, they should be uh, they should work towards um, with uh, protocols, um, for, for example. Um, and that's where um, I think uh, what what's needed for 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 us to reach at that sp uh, stage is uh, for. I would say normal users to be able to understand um, DeFi uh, and not that, not just DeFi but uh, crypto space as a whole. 
um, so that everyone uh, understands uh, the implications and, and the risk. And maybe uh, there are some tools that can help um, regulations and, 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 and help regulators uh, be able to, to come to an agreement at, at, at some point. Um, not sure if that answers your question though. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, regulators will very soon, I think not. It, it's not gonna take long for them to find out how limiting their current approach is and how unpractical their reg- legislation is about to be. And that is going to you know, give them a reality call when they look at how these projects, you know, all of these protocols are booming elsewhere in the world. And that's when they'll be like, we better play the catch up game. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thanks, Misa, for tuning in and sharing your great insights. Um, so, uh, Dimitra, Dimitra, uh, you can ask your question now. Yes. Hi, guys. Uh, I have a question, actually two questions to the to the Contango team, uh, because like right now, one of the biggest challenges that I see in DeFi, uh, really for DeFi to grow, is that a lot of the protocols are, are building in silo. Yes, like they source their own liquidity, they have their own market makers, and like the pricing of the different protocols is based on, okay, what are what is that protocol's LPs or market makers decide that they should put the price in, which, which really creates like, we do not like build on, on top of some unifying, you know, benchmark or, 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 or even ground. Yes. So when you were designing Contango uh, and you needed to pick like which fixed rate protocols you're going to, you're going to integrate with, yes, and, and you're going to basically price price your uh, futures contracts on those fixed rate protocols. Uh, were you, um, what were your design challenges when you were seeing that, for example, the different protocols have completely different rates? And how do you build around that? Okay, so um, I think there are different elements of answers. Um, like, like at least, like, how did we choose the, the first protocols and to what can we say about the discrepancy uh, around the rates? So on the first one, I think it's very straightforward. Uh, the fixed rate market is so young that when we started to, to develop Contango uh, at the end of 2021, like we, we had only two options, being like yield protocol and national finance, which are the two biggest protocols for, for fixed rate in DeFi. Um, they're both using a very similar mechanism, which is called zero coupon bonds. Uh, so that was a no brainer. And also because we, we do a lot of uh, transactions, meaning like we borrow, we swap, we land all that in one atomic swap. We wanted to, to also launch on, on layer two and the only protocol at the moment offering fixed rate with a bit of liquidity is a yield protocol. Uh, on Arbitrum. So this is why the first release is going to be yield on Arbitrum. So, um, and then the second question on the differences between the, the fixed rate is, is very interesting because that's also the vision of Contango. Like, we want to integrate as many fixed rates as possible to have the deepest liquidity, of course. But that also means that you are going to be able to trade futures on different markets, different protocols. So you, you could have like a USDC, USDC futures, for example, on national versus yields. And if there is really a discrepancy between the two rates, then you are going to be able to, to ARB with leverage. And this is extremely powerful. Uh, or you're going to be able to ARB um, between USDC and DAI. I took the example USDC, USDC, or DAI, DAI, but I'm not sure one protocol will recognize the other token on the same currency, so this needs to be double-checked. But for example, on USDC, DAI, between the same protocol first, you could have futures on this market, and you could have an intermarket like USDC, DAI, with USDC, for example, landing on, on yield and, and DAI borrowing on, on national. And basically by offering like leverage products, 
having different uh, interest rates on different uh, stablecoins, for example, we are all trading houses or any retail investor to enter into arbitrage positions. And even more interesting, when you have um, a difference of rates between CFI and DeFi, it will also mean that your futures are going to be priced differently between CFI and DeFi. And by doing the ARB on the futures, implicitly what you're doing is to bring back equilibrium between the interest rates between CFI and DeFi. So we strongly believe Contango is a, is a, is a really nice uh, pillar and uh, building block to bring stability into the interest rates across CFI, DeFi, and several protocols, and even several currencies. Mm, thanks a lot. If, if I can just also ask my, my second question, which is like very, very fast, just because like you mentioned those transactions that you're doing, yes, like you're going to borrow and then you're going to swap and then, then you're going to lend uh, like all within one transaction. So a little bit like more of a techie question, but like what is like the biggest challenge that you faced when you were developing that, that contract? Like when you were developing that entire uh, yeah. atomic swap. Yeah, so this atomic swap, um, like I gave the, the really high level, but the, the way that it really works, it works through a flash swap. So basically what we're doing is like, for example, if we're on an ETH die futures, what we're doing is to first get ETH from uni, land ETH, out of fixed rates, get the token representing this fixed rate position, and then use this token as collateral to borrow, DAI. And of course, you need to be over collateralized. So we, we managed to provide leverage indeed because we're doing a flash swap. And the DAI we have borrowed, we combine it with the DAI from the margin uh, of the traders. And this is what we give back to to uni to to honor the the flash swap, and um, like this is where you have like interesting technicalities coming into the game because, for example, if you want to build a futures between yield and national, what you would need is to have the landing token from one protocol being uh, recognized as a collateral to borrow. Okay, so for example, the landing token of yield needs to be recognized as collateral to borrow on national. Uh, so this is where it, it can get tricky and this get even trickier if you look outside the zero coupon bond mechanism. I'm thinking about yield stripping or I'm even thinking about like interest rate swap where basically you're gonna need to be able to, to borrow at a floating rate against a token on the fixed rate and then do an interest rate swap to have a, a fixed rate flow. Um, yeah, this is where it gets technical. It's more on the business side than strongly on the dev side, but it also means that uh, we're very early and I would say it's a good news. Thanks a lot. I really love what you guys are doing. I think that protocols like Contango are really going to bring DeFi forward. Thanks for the kind words. Thanks, Dimitar, for the question. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, please request to become speaker now. Otherwise, uh, we'll wrap it up. Okay. Okay, all right. Um, so thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, anyone who wants to learn more about Contango, you can follow their Twitter account at Contango underscore Dex or visit their website Contango.exchange to stay updated on their news and updates. Uh, we're really glad to have Contango as one of our incubated projects and help us bring new innovations to DeFi and Web3. So any builders out there listening to Alpha 
to us. Uh, Alpha Incubate uh, Incubation Program application is now open until 15th of October. So check out our website at alphaadventuredao.io to apply and learn more about this. Okay, thank you everyone for tuning in again. And thank you, Camille, Mitch, and Nippon for joining us. Thanks so much thank for having us. Thank you. Thank you.